worked with the Alaskan Energy Authority since 1994, managing various things. And I said he's the lead engineer for Alaska Energy Authority's World Energy Program and holds the master's degree <coughs> in mechanical engineering from the University of Wisconsin, Shola Energy Lab. Please, for us, you would. Thank you, Pierre. <clears throat> well, I always try to do something a little different at the beginning of my presentations to get grab people's interest, but uh, that's the first time I tried that one. <laughs> seemed to work. Um, well, Alan's going to help me with this presentation, and uh, I really appreciate his assistance on it. I, I'm a part-time powerhouse project manager. He's a full-time powerhouse project manager. Um, so I'll just jump right into this. These are uh, the goals of the presentation. I'd actually I'd like to leave you with, with two general ideas or, or, or significant ideas. One is that um, these power systems in rural Alaska, um, it's, it's one system. The wind, the diesel, the distribution system, and the loads, and the heat recovery, it's one system. And one of the things that, that I've noticed in uh, recent years is that it, it's uh, less successful to work on one aspect of it without actually incorporating all aspects of it. The second idea I want to leave you with after my presentation is that many aspects of these systems are changing dramatically. Um, and I'll talk about some of the technology that's changing, but the villages are changing really fast, which m makes it hard to hit that moving target of the loads and the needs in the communities. So this is, my, this is really my presentation right here. Everything else just bolsters these ideas. And, um, the numbers that I've got here are, in some cases, based on empirical data, but in many cases, um, uh, a good estimate from an engineer, not necessarily me, but some of the uh, uh, consultants we work with, and Chris Noonan in our office. Al and I both work for Chris when we're uh, doing powerhouse work. So to start off with, uh, heat recovery. Might sound like a really old idea, uh, maybe something that's not changing very fast, but I'll show you. Some, uh, the, uh, some of the applications that we're working on, Alan's taking the lead on some of these. They're changing pretty fast. Traditional jacket water heat recovery from a diesel uh, has an impact on estimated, reduc on, on estimated fuel savings of wind turbines of approximately 10%. So that's the low end of the range you see there is traditional jacket water. Um, and that's often providing heat to a school or some load like that that's seasonal as well. Um, there's three technologies that, that I think of. The ja after the jacket water comes a wet manifold or a marine manifold. I'm going to show you some photos of um, uh, something we've been using in that area, uh, which typically uh, will get you 15 to 20 percent impact on uh, uh, the savings from wind energy. And maybe I should explain that idea. When you provide a wind kilowatt hour and it offsets a diesel kilowatt hour, you, it also offsets the, uh, the heat recovery from, that comes out of that because the majority of the energy in, a, in a, uh, a unit of diesel fuel actually goes up the stack or out the radiator rather than uh, produces electricity in, in one of these powerhouses. Um, and then the final uh, technology that is being used in a number of places around the state and, and probably will be used further uh, and that my agency is doing some uh, uh, it field research on is uh, stack heat recovery. Uh, diesel efficiency, I'll show you some uh, generator, some uh, curves, efficiency curves. We estimate the, the range is probably zero to about 30% impact on uh, the generator efficiency of running generators at low load, which is often what happens in a wind diesel scenario. Um, station service, I don't have a lot of good data on this. I'd appreciate it if, if somebody in the audience does. Um, it's not even clear sometimes whether there's, there's a station service meter on the, um, the wind turbines themselves. But um, this, is, this is a range that we've seen some indication of, 1% to 8%. And it, it goes for things like uh, resistance heaters to... Um, 
keep the controls warm and uh, reduce condensation on any, and impacts on the controls. Uh, warm transmissions where there is a transmission, meters, and then start up power as well. Power factor correction. Uh, often in these projects, um, there's a need for power factor correction. It can actually be exacerbated by um, high wind penetration. We've seen this in uh, Unilaclete. Um, there's some uh, large induction motors at the fish processing plant there. And um, because the, the, the wind turbines produce unity power factor, we've actually, and, and they all, and they're uh, at times have fairly high penetration as you've seen. Uh, we've seen power factors as low as 40% uh, uh, and um, there's a risk of, of actually tripping the, the entire system offline if the uh, diesel generator can't handle that. Uh, line and transformer losses, this is referring specifically to the, the distribution line to the wind farm which is added onto the system for the purposes of the uh, of the, the wind project, and then of course there'll be transformer losses associated with that, uh, even when the wind turbines aren't um, operating because they need to be energized. Uh, this, this last category, uh, something that's been talked about, 50% is a rough number, but um, uh, heating efficiency in, the in these communities is often uh, about 70, 80% on an annual basis, which is about twice as much efficiency as you get out of a, a diesel gen set, and so that impacts the, the savings if you use wind energy for heating purposes. You want to add anything, Alan? No, nope, you're good. Um, this is actually one of the uh, more creative things that, that my agency's done, and I think uh, Bob Havemeister, Chris Noonan get a lot of credit for this, Brian Gray as well. Um, they designed a custom marine manifold for a Caterpillar 3456. This particular gen set, it's a tier two gen set, so it's not legal to install new anymore, but um, it's one of the most efficient engines that uh, we have found in this size range. And so, but it wasn't available with a marine manifold. So these, these guys, creative guys that I work with, uh, uh, found a way to retrofit equipment from other CAT gen sets. Um, uh, right here you can, that dark thing there is the exhaust manifold on the before engine. And over here you can see it's covered up. This is the wet manifold which has coolant in it. Uh, the um, water pump's on the right side there and there's a turbo. This is a turbocharger here on this engine but that we had to replace it with a different turbocharger that's over here on this end of uh, this engine. And uh, we've done quite a bit of testing in our um, shop on these engines. We found that uh, running it in this configuration doesn't impact uh, generation efficiency, but there is something like a 50% improvement in um, heat recovery. So it's very significant. You wanna add that? Yeah. That's, and you've got a graph coming up on that, right? Yeah. Okay. yeah. So here's, and I apologize, I'll, I'll let you know what it says, but at least you can see the lines. Um, the top line there, that black one, is the um, estimated heating load in Unilaclete. There's a district heating loop there, and it, what does it go to the school and offices and water plant? Yeah. yeah. So, community so anything, building. community building, I think the, it's, a, it's a, quite a nice heating loop with a high demand. So um, the estimated annual demand is 85,000 gallons of year. That's the equivalent um, stove oil heating usage. Um, and then so I'll start at the bottom here. This green line is the uh, heat recovery that you would get meeting that load with a uh, 3456 just jacket water. And this powerhouse that's recently been completed has got two 34, uh, no, four 3456s in it. Two of them are standard, two of them have the, um, the advanced marine manifold on them. So if you just use the standard ones, that's the heat recovery you would get, and that works out to 34,000 gallons a year of savings. You can see in the summertime, June, July, when the school's closed, uh, the load goes way down, and so there are no savings claimed, even though there's heat production, or, or minimal savings claimed there, even though there's uh, significant heat production. So the, um, the blue line is what you would get if you used a 3512, which is what they had in that powerhouse previously. Um, 
uh, much larger engines, about double the capacity, and that would produce uh, uh, 60,000 gallons per year of savings. Um, pretty significant, quarter million dollars approximately of uh, savings. And, uh, and then the red line is the 3456 with the marine conversion, which I, this, this conversion here, uh, so you can see that from the green line to the red line is a very significant change, and that's 71,000 gallons of savings, so more than twice as much. Um, and this kind of goes with that theme I mentioned earlier that these, the technology is changing. Um, and then, uh, well, I guess that, that's all I had on that one. Any, any questions? By the way, I'm happy to take questions during the presentation. I think it's a good way to uh, keep people involved. Alan, you want to talk about this one? Sure, sure, so. sure. This is a, let's call it an experiment. We did. This is the Chitna Powerhouse. And what we have here is, this is a John Deere uh, four-cylinder engine. It's a 117 kW, uh, typical maximum kW output. And typically, you would just come right up out of, this is the turbocharger. And uh, these are the cooling systems that we, in, in the powerhouses that we designed, we would go to a common manifold. In this case, what we did <coughs> was take um, oh, this charge here, excuse me. This is the uh, cooling system that we would typically go to a common radiator or a heat recovery system. In this case, what we did, and this would usually be a thimble, just a, a, a straight piece of exhaust pipe up to, that's a, that's a muffler or a silencer, whatever you like to call it, okay? So instead of just installing a thimble, just a straight piece of pipe, what we did, uh, this is stainless steel. We had this, we just had this welded up in town, okay? And it's a double wall uh, stainless steel cylinder, okay? So what we did was, instead of inserting just a piece of uh, straight exhaust pipe and, and exhausting it out, we actually have the engine coolant circulating through this pipe and then coming back out to the common cooling system to get, again, to get added heat without the complexity of a more, uh, some other typical uh, exhaust heat recoveries that have clogging problems and something, et cetera. This inside diameter, there's nothing special about it. It just goes straight through it. Um, some of the concerns we had are, are we getting any uh, glycol scorching? Is there anything we want to actually take this off and cut it open and see if we had any glycol scorching on this, on, on this uh, exhaust manifold. But we estimate, and actually we're going to, we, we plan to work with possibly ACEP and put uh, some, uh, we don't have any uh, temperature monitors or flow monitors on this, but we would estimate, the engineering estimation is that we get about 10% more heat when this engine's running with this configuration. And also, if this were to cause a problem, if we had a problem with this, we would just pull it out, take the hoses, connect them back up to the common cooling system, and we're back in business, i.e. keeping the power on. You know, we have to be careful with when we do this with the exhaust system. And you might be wondering what this little blue tube is on this connected. What, and each engine has it. That is how we keep the engines warm if they're not running. So if we have another engine in the bank, this powerhouse has a bank of three. If we were to, if this engine wasn't running, we need to keep the stack up, to, excuse me, the water jacket up to temperature so this engine can be put on light immediately. So this little bit of, of this goes back into the engine and circulates the common cooling system water through the engine so that engine is always at, let's say, say 180 degrees if that's what the cooling, the, the common rail for the cooling system is at. So that's kind of what that description is. Are there any questions on that? Alan, do you want to say anything about studying this or gathering Well, ACP, on? we're thinking about, uh, I, I did a little bit. Um, we want to work with ACP and, and Put another one of these in into Ruby or Igiagi, or come back on this one and monitor it and actually get what the what the actual BTUs are. Is this is this worth employing, and 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 is this type of installation worth it? it, it you know, again, it's a small amount of heat recovery, but again, if you're running this engine 24/7 for five or six months a year, that amount of heat can add up real quickly at five six bucks a gallon for diesel. Today. And one other. Uh, one of the reasons that there's more interest and more development in heat recovery is that uh, um, Alaska is going to ultra-low sulfur diesel now, and with less sulfur in the fuel, there's less risk of acid forming in the uh, exhaust stack, and so these, these systems are easier to, to, to make successful. Was there a question back there? 
thought, thought I saw a hand up. Oh, yes, sir. Um, I don't have those numbers, and, and it, this is a good question, and you're obviously an engineer. Uh, with a, th there's so many variables in this. I mean, you, you could engineer this very specifically and put a lot of controls and feedback logic on it to ensure you had the temperatures you want and all that. Or you can just build it and see how it works. And um, I, I'm an engineer. I'm an advocate for, for design and engineering things in general. But with so many unknowns and variables, um, this is an interesting way to get one in the field and, and uh, start gathering some data on it. So, but I, I very much appreciate the question. And not impact the emissions or add any maintenance to the system. Typical other heat exchangers that we've had, the limited amount of uh, exhaust heat exchangers that we've had uh, experience with come with maintenance requirements, blow downs, check for soot, build up as, as, as David suggested. So this was an easy way to recover 10%, we believe, recover heat without impacting maintenance or reliability. Yes, sir. Uh, can you explain this uh, cooling system that shared with you in the test? How is that done? Maybe afterwards. Uh, Dave, you need to get through your presentation. Yeah. Okay. If we, can we do yeah. that afterwards? Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I actually picked this the information off of one of Kat's slides I found online, so I hope that's okay, <laughs> Kat. Tell me if it's wrong. Um, but it, I, I thought this was really interesting and, and, uh, and admirable. Uh, there's an enormous amount of wasted energy in a gen set that doesn't use heat recovery. And Kotzebue is going to kind of the other extreme in terms of uh, taking advantage of it uh, in as many ways as possible. In fact, I think there's one way I didn't even list here. If anybody knows, uh, please uh, speak up. But um, their goal is to use 85% of the, the energy in the fuel. And uh, that is, is a really uh, valuable thing. But it, when you introduce wind energy, this, this reduces the economics, the uh, benefits of the, of the wind turbines. So um, I wanted to put this slide up to show you that, that 3456, the, the big yellow machine I had on the screen a few minutes ago, that's the, the upper curve here. And um, for people who are not familiar with uh, diesel efficiency versus uh, power output curves. I, I, this is a very valuable curve. Now, maybe it's because I'm a mechanical engineer, but I find this fascinating stuff. Uh, that engine there has been optimized for power generation uses. Uh, and I don't know uh, the, man the manufacturer's explanation, but I suspect that uh, these are probably op optimized for p maximum power output or for truck applications. A lot of these engines are truck engines. But what you see here is that not only is the curve a very, very different shape, but it's very much higher for this engine. Uh, over 15 and a half kilowatt hours per gallon through its sweet spot, which is where you would design it for operation. Whereas you look at these and they're barely breaking above uh, 14. That's very significant. Um, and that it's actually one of the points I wanna make is that uh, when you're thinking about doing wind projects and the benefits of wind projects, I would encourage you to start with thinking about heat recovery and diesel efficiency because often there's low hanging fruit there that can be picked that is very economically uh, attractive. These other uh, engines I've got uh, on here, are there's a 3508, uh, the 3512, the one that runs out that far. Uh, these are typical uh, gen sets you see in use all over the state. Uh, here's a similar type of information. Note the shape of the curve, you don't have that uh, uh, optimized curve on any of these engines. It's not a reflection on John Deere, it's just that these are smaller engines, they're less efficient, and the efficiency drops off faster as you get down to the low end of the curve. Um, I wanted to make one point on, on this one. Uh, I got a, a SCADA screenshot from, a SCADA screenshot from uh, Mark Teitzel of AVEC uh, recently. It was the um, Kasigluk uh, wind project. And it was, it was showing a real stellar performance. I think it was 280 kW of wind output. And they had a 3456 running at uh, 80 kW load. Um, and so if, if the diesel had been carrying the entire load, it would have been at 360 
which would be right up here at the peak, 15, over 15 and a half kilowatt hours per gallon. As it is, it was down here at a little over 11 and a half, under 12 kilowatt hours per gallon. So that's some of that effect that we're talking about of um, wind impacts, unintended consequences, wind impacts on diesel efficiency. Yes, sir? Is that high efficiency diesel, is that the tier two or tier three? It's tier two. And that's one of the other things that's changing. I'll have a little more information on that as well. This, uh, can, can you see that light blue curve there? Uh, that's the 3456 as well. I put this one up because uh, there's uh, one of the Alaskan utilities was looking at replacing um, a gen set and they thought seriously about installing this one here, uh, CAT C27. Uh, you can see it's got you know somewhat similar range to the 3456, but oh my gosh, look at that difference in efficiency. The bottom here, this is nine, so um, through its range of, of where you would expect it to operate, the uh, the difference is between uh, 10 and 30 percent in efficiency. So this is just the choice of a gen set. It's not as if you're you know bringing in some fancy new equipment that you wouldn't have bought otherwise. They had to buy a gen set. Just the choice of the gen set was very significant in this case. And uh, back to my point about uh, thinking about diesel efficiency opportunities, this is FY09 PCE data, power cost equalization. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with it. My agency runs that program. And um, in the PCE program, uh, in FY09, 1% of the kilowatt hours came from wind 6% from hydro and 93% from diesel. So my, my point is, going back to this one, if you can capture even 10% diesel savings or 2%, the impact is really going to be significant in rural Alaska. Kat, how am I doing on time? Out of, out of time? OK. Well, I've got uh, one more slide. OK. Uh, this is a. Um, diesel efficiency slide that I put together. This is PCE data as well. So, you know, there could be some uh, uh, effects in this data that are, that are not apparent. For example, seasonality, wind power tends to uh, peak in the wintertime and it's colder, which would affect diesel efficiency. And I also want to show that this scale here is expanded. It goes from 13 to 14.4. But basically, when you go from zero to 50% efficiency, uh, and you, if you follow this curve here, there's about a 5% drop in diesel efficiency. And so this is empirical data, which is why I thought it was interesting to show um, the, the effect of diesel efficiency. Okay.